praises are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We praise Him, we seek His help, and we seek His forgiveness. And we seek shelter with Allah from the evils of ourselves and from the misdeeds of our actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, none of Him is guide. And whomsoever Allah leaves astray, you will find no guide for them. And I testify that nothing deserves worship except Allah alone without any partner. And I testify that Muhammad is his servant and messenger. May Allah exalt his mention and grant him peace. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu attaqu allaha haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. O you who have believed, fear Allah as much fear as he deserves. And do not die except that you are Muslims. And Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal nas, ittaqu wa rabbakum wa alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida wa khalaqa minha zawjaha wa batha minhuma rijalan kathira wa nisaha wa attaqu Allah alladhi tasa'aluna bihi wa al-harham inna Allah kena alaykum raqiba O humankind, through your Lord, the one who created you from a single individual and create from him this wife, and spread from those to many men and women. And fear Allah, the one by whom you all demand the fulfillment of your rights, and do not sever the ties of the womb. Truly, Allah has always been watchful over you. And Allah Azza wa Jal says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu attaqu allaha wa quulu qawlan sadeeda yuslih lakum a'malakum wa yaghfir lakum zunubakum وَمَنْ يُطْعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ فَازَ فَوْزًا عَظِيمًا O you who have believed, fear Allah and speak a right and just word. He will rectify your deeds for you and forgive your sins for you. And whoever obeys Allah and His Messenger, then they have truly won a great victory. أَمَّا بَعْدِ In the seerah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the life of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, the mercy to the world. He first received the revelation at age 40. The call to Islam, the da'wah was prided those first years, but not unknown. But he was ignored. And then he began to proclaim openly. And the ridicule and persecution really began. The Quraysh tribe made a social boycott against the Muslims and their allies of Banu Hashim and Banu Mufal's clans. There was to be no buying and selling with them, and no marriage with them. What would you do if you lived in an economic hub, yet all the grocery stores and even the gas stations had signs saying, no business to Muslims? You would starve just as the Prophet and his companions starved. After surviving like this for three long years, some of the companions said that when they looked at their stomachs, they could see the green from the leaves and plant matter that they were digesting. But then Allah's Messenger had a dream that the leather piece that the boycott was written on was eaten by insects, even though that parchment was in a locked box. When the Quraysh were challenged, they agreed. And when it was discovered that the Prophet Sallallahu dream was true, the boycott ended. But the boycott took a great toll on the Muslims and their allies. The main defender of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam outside the home. His protector, his uncle, Abu Talib, the chief of the clan of Ben Hashim, passed away shortly after the boycott ended. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that he never experienced any real harms until then. And then just three days later, the Prophet's wife of 25 years and mother of his children, Khadija bin Khuwaydid radiallahu anha, she passed away. The main support that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had inside the home. And all of a sudden, it was like he was alone in the world with just a few followers in a city that hated him. He went to Qa'if, a nearby city, calling them to Islam, but met with so much more rejection and ridicule and physical tortures and pain than he ever experienced in Mecca. He would later say that this was the worst moment of his life. And it was the climax of what the companions referred to as Aramun prison, 
the year of sadness and sorrow for the Prophet Sallallahu But on his way out of Claudia, heading towards Mecca, in a scene reminiscent of when Musa السلام, sought the shade of a tree after leaving Egypt and made dua for any goodness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had in store for him, the Prophet sallallahu prayed, To you, my Lord, I complain of my weakness, my lack of support, and the humiliation I am made to receive. Most compassionate and merciful, you are the Lord of the weak, and you are my Lord. To whom do you lead me? To a distant person who receives me with hostility? Or to an enemy you have given power over me? As long as you are not displeased with me, I do not care what I face. I would, however, be much happier with your mercy. I seek protection in the light of your face, by which all darkness is dispelled, and both this life and the life to come are put in their right course against incurring your wrath or being the subject of your anger. To you I submit until I earn your pleasure. Everything is powerless without your support. When the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made that dua and he continued on his journey, he met a Christian man named Adas, who then embraced Islam. He met Jibril and the angel of the mountains who affirmed their support. He met a group of the jinn who also embraced Islam. And not long later, two or three men from yesterday whom he met, they too embraced Islam. But those were all small, external, symbolic victories, while the persecution he met from his neighbors, countrymen, and even his uncle Abu Dhahab, the new leader of his own clan, continued unabated. And then one night, Allah's Messenger وسلم, was in a state of drowsiness around the Masjid al Haram laying down between two other men, and three angels came and spoke to each other. Which one is he? He is the one in the middle, the best of them. And they noted that his eyes sleep while his heart stays awake, like all the other prophets of Allah. They picked up the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and brought him to the well of Zemzem, where the chief of all the angels, Jibreel alayhi salam, was waiting. Jibreel had a golden tray full of wisdom and belief, hikmah and iman. And he then cut open the Prophet from the bottom of the throat to the lower part of the abdomen and washed his insides with zamzam water and then poured the hikmah and iman, the wisdom and faith, into his heart. And then a white animal smaller than a mule, bigger than a donkey, was brought to the Prophet Sallallahu all saddled and reined. The animal became shy. Jibril said, Is it from Muhammad that you do this? By your Lord, there is no one more honorable to your Lord than him. And the animal started sweating greatly. The Prophet Sallallahu mounted it, while Jibril was with him, and each stride of the animal called al Burak. Each of al Burak's strides was as far as the eye could see. Jibril السلام, told the animal to stop and told the Prophet وسلم, to dismount and pray. When they got to Ayan, Jibril said, This is Tayyibah, the land that you will migrate to. They moved on until Jibril السلام, then told Burak again to stop and the Prophet وسلم, to dismount and pray. And after doing so, Jibreel said, This is Sinai, the place where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Musa alayhi salam. They moved on until Jibreel alayhi salam again told al Burak to stop and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to dismount and pray. And he said, This is Baytul Laham, the place where Isa alayhi salam was born. And then Jibreel alayhi salam took the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Baytul Maqdis, Jerusalem, and he pointed with his finger towards a rock, and the rock split open, and he tied al Barak to a ring that was revealed. This is the post of the prophets that they would tie their mounts to. And all the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were assembled before him, 
And Jibreel told the Prophet وسلم, to stand in front of them and lead them all in prayer. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, led them into Raqqa'ah and then Jibreel وسلم, took him to the next stage of his journey that night up to the heavens and ultimately to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next day, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa told some about his experience and the news quickly spread. Some of the Quraysh, they seized upon this opportunity and helped spread it because they thought it was impossible and scandalous. When they came to Abu Bakr and told him, Abu Bakr said, if Muhammad says it, then it is true. When the Prophet وسلم, came to the Kaaba later that day, they asked him to describe the streets and buildings of Jerusalem. Of course, he was there in night time and in limited capacity, but at that moment Allah Taala showed him a vision of the old town, and so he did describe it for them in great detail. As he said, <laughs> They then dismissed him and called it magic. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayah, Subhanallahi asra bi abdihi laylan min al masjid al haram ila al masjid al aqsa alladhi barakna hawlahu li nuriyahu min ayatihi innahu huwa al sami'u al basir min ayatina. How perfect and glorified is the one who took his servant one night from al-Masjid al-Haram in Mecca to al-Masjid al-Aqsa in Jerusalem, whose surrounding areas we have blessed so that we may show him of our signs. And he is the hearing, the seeing. The very first ayah from Surah al-Isra, meaning the night journey, Surah 17 of the Qur'an is also called Surah Bani Israel, the children of Israel. For this opening ayah, this opening verse of the surah connects the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the first house of worship ever built for humankind by Ibrahim alayhi salam and his son Ismail with the Masjid al-Aqsa, the second house of worship ever built for humanity by Ibrahim and Ishaq or by Yaqub otherwise known as Israel. And a masjid al aqsa would later be built again more properly by Sulaiman ibn Dawood alayhi wasalam. It would become the primary house of worship, the focal point of all worship and ceremony, sacrifice, ritual holiday for the children of Israel for centuries. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَضَيْنَا إِلَىٰ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ فِي الْكِتَابِ لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَّتَيْنِ وَلَتَعْنُنَّ عُلُوًا كَبِيرًا And we decreed to the children of Israel in the Torah that they would fall into great sins, idolatry and transgression two times, and they would become extremely arrogant. In the opening ayahs, of Surah Al-Isra, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recounts the harrowing details of the children of Israel and Masjid Al-Aqsa and how Allah punished them. First, when the Babylonians sacked the city under the command of Nebuchadnezzar and carried them away in chains. So when the time of promise came for the first of those two, we sent against you servants of ours, those of great military might, and they probed even into your homes. And it was a promise fulfilled. The Babylonians carried them away in chains until the Persians conquered the Babylonians and then Cyrus the Great, whom some believe is both our name, sent the children of Israel back to Palestine, back to Jerusalem, and rebuilt their temple for them. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَا لَكُمُ الْقَرَّةَ عَلَيْهِمْ وَأَمْدَدْنَاكُمْ بِأَمْوَالٍ وَبَلِينَ وَجِعَمْنَاكُمْ أَكْثَرَ نَفِيرًا Then we gave back to you a return victory over them. 
and we reinforced you with wealth and sons and made you more numerous in manpower. Allah says, In ahsantum ahsantum li anfusikum wa in asattum falaha. If you do good, you do good for your own selves. And if you do evil, you do it to yourselves. فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ الْآخِرَةِ يَسُوءُ وُجُوهَكُمْ لِيَدْخُلُوا الْمَسْجِدَ كَمَا دَخَلُوهُ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةٍ وَلِيُتَبِّرُوا مَا عَلَوْ تَتْبِيرًا And then when the final promise came, we sent your enemies to set in your faces and to enter the temple in Jerusalem as they entered it the first time and to destroy what they had taken over with total destruction. That was when the occupying Romans exiled them from Jerusalem, Beit al and the children of Israel were forever scattered. Beit al or Quds, Jerusalem was the home to the prophets of Allah. From the time of Ibrahim السلام, until Zachariya, Isa, and Yahya السلام. And even for the Prophet Muhammad and the Muslims of Mecca, that was their qibla, the direction they faced in prayer. And they continued facing it for 16 months after moving to Medina, formerly Yathrib, also known as Qayba. And the Romans turned al Masjid al Aqsa into a city garbage heap and just left one part of the original building standing. When the Muslims liberated the city after a brief siege, just a few short years after the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, the Khalifa Umar ibn Khattab anhu, he started cleaning it with his own hands. And then the Sahaba joined him. And Bilal called the Adan and they prayed there. And a new time of peace and prosperity came to the land, the likes of which had not been seen in recent memory. And not to be disrupted until the Fatimids and then the Crusades, Napoleon and the French, the British, and what we see our time today. In all of this, there are lessons for people to understand. If we go back to the life of Allah's Messenger وسلم, the private da'wah, the public da'wah, ridicule and persecution, the boycott, the deaths of those near, and if we also think of the trials suffered by the children of Israel being led away in chains and being further exiled and scattered <coughs> around the earth, the good among them suffering along with the bad, we see Allah's trials for individuals have different wisdom than Allah's trials for nations and groups. And while the children of Israel disobeyed Allah every imaginable way and worshipped other deities, Baal and Esterah, among others, there were always good individuals among them commanding towards good and forbidding from evil, prophets and their followers, suffering as a direct result of the sins of the rest. It is those righteous individuals that bear the trials with strength and endurance that ultimately come out ahead and lead new generations. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْهُمْ أَهِمَّةً يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا لَمَّا صَبَرُوا وَكَانُوا بِآيَاتِنَا يُوْقِنُونَ And we may leaders from them, guided by our command, once they show patience, endurance and strength and more of certain faith in our signs and revelations. And just like that with the first believers in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Urqba ibn al-Ghazwan, he reflected as governor of Iraq, he said, Islam was just six or seven people in those first days. I was one of them. But now there is not a single individual among them except that they are a governor of some province or the general of a huge army. What is happening now? You see death and destruction. You see families being torn apart and blown apart. You see careers being ruined for tweets or involvement. You see threats and intimidation. It's as if the ummah is being put into an oven, a hot oven. But when that oven timer is done, leaders will come out of it. So ask yourself if you are one of them.
وقول القول هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين والمسلمات من كل دم استغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. I say these words and I seek Allah's forgiveness for me and you and all the Muslims from every sin. So seek His forgiveness for you, the all forgiving, especially merciful. Brothers and sisters in Islam, today is according to some estimations of 28th or the 29th of Rajab. It's popularly believed that the night journey took place on the 27th of Rajab, although most narrations mention Rabi al Awwal, Allah knows best. The month of Sha'ban starts this weekend, and Ramadan comes after that. But in preparation for what is coming immediately and what we feel most certain about, when Usama ibn Zayd when he asked the Prophet about the month of Sha'ban, the Messenger of Allah said, That is a month that the people neglect between Rajab and Ramadan. And it is a month in which the deeds are held up and displayed all throughout to the Lord, Master of the Worlds. And I love that my deeds be displayed while I am fasting. Regarding fasting in Sha'ban, the Prophet's wife, Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, مَا رَأَيْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ اسْتَكْمَنَ صِيَامَ شَهْرٍ قَطُّ إِلَّا رَمَضَانَ وَمَا رَأَيْتُهُ فِي شَهْرٍ أَكْثَرَ مِنْهُ صِيَامًا فِي شَعْبَانٍ I never saw the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم complete the fast of anyone ever except Ramadan, nor did I see him fast in any other month more than his fasting in Sha'ban. The companion said that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم fasted nearly all of Sha'ban, or even the entire month, connecting it with Ramadan. However, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, if the middle of Sha'ban has arrived, then do not fast. And he said, Do not precede the month of Ramadan fasting a day or two, except for a man who is used to fasting such a fast, then let him fast it. The words of the Prophet bring reconciliation for us telling us if we want to fast Sha'ban, we should start early before the month reaches its halfway point and develop a pattern for fasting then. But if you haven't made such a pattern, then do not start right before Ramadan as you may tire yourself before the obligatory fast. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But the ulama, they refer to Sha'ban as Shahlu Qurwa, the month of the reciters. Because in Ramadan everyone recites the Qur'an, but in Sha'ban only the people of the Qur'an maintain and increase their devotion. So will you make yourself one of them? Fasting and worshipping in Sha'ban are like performing sunnah prayer before the harb, before the obligatory prayer. The more you prepare yourself for a thing, the easier that greater thing will be and more beneficial. And so if you want to make this Ramadan more meaningful and more memorable, and begin with the exercise now of fasting, reciting, and charity. O oh Allah, have mercy upon us and forgive us and guide us to the best of deeds in this month and forgive us our shortcomings. Allahumma ameen. Allahumma barakna fi rajab wa sha'man wa badhidna wa ramadhan. Allahumma ameen. O oh Allah, bless us in rajab and sha'man and help us reach Ramadan. Ameen. O oh Allah, to you, our Lord, we complain of our weakness, lack of support, and the humiliation that we are made to receive, most compassionate and merciful. You are the Lord of the weak, and you are our Lord. To whom do you leave us, our, and our brothers and sisters, to a distance?